Hi, this is the fellow passenger and in this video I'm probably just going to talk and noodle. I'm not sure how much I will explain in this video. So if you haven't spotted it yet, I have started doing my daily posts on Instagram again. And to give a bit of context, I did this before. During lockdown, I decided to just make some music every day. And Instagram just happened to give me a nice little format to work within. You can post one minute video clips. So that's what I decided to do. And I did 100 days in a row. And I learned a lot during those 100 days. And especially when you work with generative music to, to make one minute's worth of music feels fairly doable. But then work took over and even to make a minute's worth of music was just too much and I stopped. Since then, I have quit my job I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. A crazy decision. I have no idea what's going to happen, but anyway, we'll get there. So I've started doing one minute posts on Instagram again. And in this video, I just did a screen recording when I actually made one minute. So you can go and listen to it on Instagram. You will hear it here as well as it's being made. And I'm doing this voiceover after the video had been recorded. I didn't say anything during the recording itself. So this will be a bit of an experiment for me to see if this works. So I think this is probably gonna be me sharing a little bit of philosophy while we just look at this one minute piece of music is being made. I don't know how much I will explain. Let's, let's just see, I'm just gonna play the video and then just try to talk over it. It might just not work, I don't know. Um, well, I suppose I can talk about all sorts of things while we're doing this. So the other day I watched um, while we bleep the the sort of podcast that um, Mylar Melodies is doing, interviewing different people who are supposed into modular synthesizers in one way or another. So in one recent episode, he is uh, talking to James Blake, uh, who sings nicely on top of electronic music and apparently he's very much into modular music uh, modular synthesizers i should say but at one point in the conversation he said something along the lines of you know as a musician you make your music because you just got something that you want to say you want to express something and you can't mark that. I think it was in the context of uh, critics writing about music and how, you know, like how, how, how can you say that someone's emotion is good or not? But it also made me realize that I'm not sure that's why I am making music. I, I don't know if I actually have anything to say. I might do, but I don't think that's where my motivation comes from. I think my motivation comes much more from experimenting. It literally is that I I can, you know, like wake up in the morning and think, oh, I never tried that, a little technique, and I just want to see what happens when I do it. And I think this might stem from my very early years when I started being interested in music, and it was much more the sound than necessarily the composition that I was drawn to and I just how were those sounds made how how, how did it happen or, or when you heard something really complex or that seemed complex I was just curious about the process behind it and I think that is the driving force why I make music because I'm just curious to just try things that I haven't really tried before or make something that I haven't really heard before so maybe 
my music is emotionally dead. No, I don't think so. I don't think so either because I think it's it's also about capturing a mood and I think those things play together. It's combining the little experiments I want to do with creating something that feels in a certain way. It doesn't necessarily strictly relate to something that I have, that I think there is some injustice in the world or that there is someone I'm in love with and that's that music becomes the outlet for that um I don't think that is the case for me uh here so there we are okay I'm just looking at what I am doing I have added a sampler in Ableton and I have just chucked a bunch of kick drum samples that I have generated myself and plotted them out to create some form of kick drum rhythm using different samples and then I have added in a MIDI effect, the random MIDI effect that uh, just dialing that up a little bit so the drums will play. There will be a little bit of random variation in what samples it's selecting because all the different samples are mapped to different keys on the keyboard and the random will infuse a little bit of other yeah other notes than the ones you have programmed and here i am making i remember i was thinking when i doing this like okay i need this track to be to have a little bit of tempo i don't know if i achieved that in the very end i don't think i did but i felt like a lot of the mo more recent posts that i've done were quite slow and as per usual i'm using the uh what's it called uh expression control which is a great midi device just to add a bit of randomness and this here i am using the hi-hat uh, synthesized hi-hat that comes with ableton and just randomizing the the decay so you have yeah different long hi-hats and then i've also added an lfo to um to change the tone i quite often add a, a flanger or a phaser or something like that on hi-hats to create that sort of sweeping motion and i was just wanting to try to do that here okay so back to the kicks again uh, I see that I am enabling the pitch envelope which makes a quick pitch drop happen which makes the kick drums snap a bit more uh, makes them also sound a bit plasticky sometimes but maybe that's okay um, so I see now I just because I stop the pitch much higher than the original pitch and it pitches down but because it starts so high it looks like I've transposed the kicks down a bit yeah so music making I have had a bunch of very nice messages on patreon recently uh, one guy who he said like, okay he's old he uh, you know but he's still learning and he he started off making music on the Amiga and using tracker software and I don't know if his assumption was that I wasn't as old but I think I have to admit I am I started there as well I can't remember if it was sound tracker or noise tracker or pro tracker or whatever it was that I noise tracker is that the new one Renoise, let's renoise. Yes, anyway, it was a tracker software that I started on on the Amiga, eventually moving on to Octomed and then moving on to lots of other pieces of software in that process. And in a way, I feel it's a bit embarrassing because I've had this hobby for such a long time. Like, I bought my first synthesizer in 96, I think. And by that time, I'd already made music in these tracker software and uh, 96 that's ages ago and what have I achieved not much and I would argue that this is one of the oldest hobbies I've had and I'm still not particularly good at it but there is something about this that makes me come back again and again sometimes there's been a gap for a few years um, 
Anyway, okay, back to look what I'm doing. I've just added the clap machine that I have a recent tutorial if you want to make your own clap sounds, which I think I'm quite impressed with by myself. It's, uh, you know, I, I tend to use those claps now and it's you get something that sounds to me interesting, but it's not just the bog standard 808 and uh, 909 claps that you hear all the time. Okay, so we've got hi-hat, we've got claps, and we've got the kick pattern, and I see I have chucked that together in, I've made a group, probably because I want to process all of them. So, ah, okay, so I am um, using the Melda Productions. This plugin is free. Uh, these pl All of these Melda plugins that you see here in the drop-down menu on the left, are free and they are amazing but the comb filter I have a special love for I think it's just instant IDM it's yeah the comb filter it's it's almost like adding a super tight delay like very short and also these Melda production things they have random buttons and you just press them till like you just end up with stuff that you would never ever have dialed in yourself so they both have the dice icon that that just picks one of the presets at random and they literally have a random icon that just randomizes all the parameters. Just listen to that. That I think that comb filter is amazing. I want to get a comb filter for my Eurorack as well. I think they sound really good. I think the 2HP does one. I have not tried it. I've not really looked into it. I've seen it and it's fairly low cost. Um, as far as low cost on Eurorack goes, I suppose. And the reverb sounds pretty nice too. I would say it's arguably nicer than the one that comes with Ableton, which I've never quite made friends with. I use it, but yeah. Okay, so I have set up an effects chain here. I see that the first one was the comb filter. The second one was the... Gosh, I've already, I've been talking, so I didn't really pay attention. Whatever the last, oh yes, I think it was another comb filter. So I see here, I create lots of chains here and I solo them one by one, just so I can focus on that particular effect at that time, just to create different moods. Gosh, these Melda production stuff, I, I love it. It's just simple, but good, good stuff, good stuff. One of the few third-party plugins I'm using, I suppose. That was, I've got a few paid ones. Uh, Melda Productions, they also have some paid ones. I don't have any of those. Um, so one of the paid ones I use is the Pro Q3 that we can see here, which I think is far superior compared to the EQ8. It feels like you have much more surgical control um, and it's got sort of a multi-band compressor in there so you can compress uh, and yeah it's very quick and easy to use I find. and that functionality if you hold the mouse down low you saw the white outline that appeared then it just holds the peaks so you see where there's a lot of peaking happening and then you can just add a, a, an EQ band there that and then just dial it down so that's obviously the this ring modulator or whatever it is that's doing this that has a really sharp high frequency sound and then I could just like surgically tone that down a bit so there you can hear it like what it sounds like with the high pitch sound okay so we're just doing another ring modulator I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm creating all this in this effects rack I'm gonna create a chain selector that then jumps between these effects um, to create a bit of variety in the beat Um, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I, I quit my job. I had a job which on paper sounded amazing. It should have been great. It could have been great, but I had given it years, literally years and I tried everything and I just couldn't make it work, I think. Not in a way that was satisfying to me. I was working at one of the big museums in London, uh, working on the 
delivering media for the exhibitions. So not advertising stuff, but more the stuff that goes into galleries. Anything from soundscapes to games to videos, video content, projection mapping. If there was something digital going into any of the new exhibitions, I was involved in that kind of thing. And pretty big museum. And I got to a point where I was not making the stuff anymore. I was managing and helping finding the right collaborators to work with us, so filmmakers, uh, sound designers, or whatever it was that we did. And met a lot of interesting people, but um, it, it just, yeah, it, it was just not that amazing creative job that it sounds like it would be. If someone would have told me the younger me and saying like, okay, you're going to work at this museum and you're going to, these are the type of things you will be doing. I would just be blown away. Um, I think it was a combination of things. Partly I felt like, even though I'd done this job for so long, and this was even the second time I worked at that museum and I'd worked to another, at another really big museum in between, some form of imposter syndrome, I think, that I just felt like, oh gosh, I've I have no clue what I'm doing and sooner or later someone is going to find out. I don't think that was actually the case, but that's what it felt like <laughs> because I must have learned a, a thing or two doing that for that many years. But it was also a difficult, I don't know, I couldn't, it's, it's almost like the, the British health system, NHS, it's a massive machine and I think if you work at the museum, if you if you know about NHS but you don't know about museums, I suppose they are almost like a smaller version of that. They are a big machine that is really difficult to change and you become a small part in the jigsaw puzzle and I just hated not being able to do the work as well as I thought it could be done. I also felt that um, different creative people we were collaborating with to create these things that could be amazing. I think the museum machine didn't really allow them to do their best work either. And I could just not, I just could not stand there with hand on heart saying that I think that what we were doing was as great as I thought it could be. And it had gotten to a point where I felt like I can't change it. And on top of that, for the big museums in, in the UK, you can just forget to get a pay rise. And it's not because the museum is nasty in any way. It's just like, they're partly government funded. There's been a massive pay freeze. The only time you have a chance to negotiate is actually when you get your job. And then that's the salary you will be on, unless you change your job. Or that there is some really rare circumstance which allows you to move move within your role, you get some new responsibilities. But yeah, it was just, I just felt really stuck and there was not much I could do about it. Um, so it just got to a point where I was, I just lost sleep over work. It was so busy, I couldn't make any music. I was never gonna get a pay rise. I was, there was just no end to the busyness either. And also doing work, which I felt like this is just not as good as it could be. I just, I was just felt locked in somehow and I just needed to get out. So I decided just to quit. So I have not worked for about a month and a half now, I suppose, maybe a tiny bit more. And I feel so much better. And that's also allowed me to do some of this starting posting videos again. That's the reason why I hadn't posted for so long. Anyway, let's look at what's happening here. So we set up that effects chain that I mentioned and um, now I'm making a tiny little bit of an arrangement. I'm jumping back and forth. I suppose I'm only gonna make a minute's worth of music, but um, in a way, I think there is, there is a great benefit of 
portion things out. You do something first and then you make a bit of an arrangement and then you do the sound design or whatever. But I also feel like I just have to jump around a little bit uh, just to keep me interested in what I'm doing. So here I'm just probably just moving, making the hi-hat sound start a bit, early, a bit later and then I'm just adding these little, what should we call them? This is something that in a way it's probably better to add right at the end. Using reverse sounds is a is a is a way of just creating a bit of tension tension suppose tension and release just sort of like sucked into the next section. So here I think it's so you sort of sucked into the hi hat section. So you just have a little change just to to keep keep uh, keep things moving. I also think it's interesting to think of. Um, the music making process here, just looking looking at these arrangements uh, that I'm making now. If you think about it, that you just, I, there was something I was struggling with. I just, before I had read up on it or looked on YouTube, I was just wondering like, what is what, a track? Like what, what parts does it go through? What happens? And then since then I've looked at it and just to create a little bit of a, a progression through the track which I found difficult you know like I could make a loop that sounded interesting but sort of moving on to different sections was hard but one there's lots of different things you have to think of but I think one thing that to think about is just so here just you can see uh, how long the sections are it's almost like you can create if, if this would be the full length track you can divide that so like something happens halfway through the hi-hat comes in if you half that, you should maybe have something interesting happening like four times within this time frame. And every eighth section, you could have a small change. And the longer the section, the bigger the change maybe. Or like if you go into completely, so, so every eighth or sixteenth part of this, Maybe you don't want a massive new section happening. It could be literally like the hi-hat changes a little bit or you add, you change the pattern a little bit just to create a little bit of interest. Oh, this is, uh, is it called Vital? The, um, this is a, a free VST plugin, which is interesting. It's, I suppose it's almost like, I, th I think, don't take my word for it. I think it's almost like a free version of Zero. It's, it's a sort of similar, similar concept, I think. And I downloaded this ages ago and then I forgot about it. And then I just rediscovered it the other day. And I think it's quite an interesting alternative to lots of the stuff in Ableton because I tend to go to those all the time. They're good, they're good, but I think different tools just makes you do different things thinking about that when now I, I, on Instagram I've posted some little things little jams I've done on the Eurorack system I've got here and um, justifying Eurorack is something that comes up again and again because it is expensive it is expensive I mean Depends on, I think it, become, it becomes expensive very quickly because you can like say like one module is, you can buy um, many modules for un, under a hundred pounds each, but you're always gonna want more. <laughs> That's, there's just no other way around it. Um, and I've stumbled upon this, I think he's a, is he Japanese or Korean guy who, makes these videos about how you can do things for free rather than buying, let's say, an OP1. He had one fairly recently about the OP1 field, which is a super in expensive instrument. I think it's almost like two grand, maybe not quite, maybe 1500 or something. And he's comparing it to these free tools that allows you to do pretty much, pretty much the same thing. Um, for free, so it's free software, but basically you use the laptop you already have and you download free software and you can do pretty much amazing stuff with it. And I get the point, it is true. Like, yeah, you can do, use what you have. Use what you have. If you have a laptop, 
and you don't have any other money to spend do it like yes absolutely but i don't think that equals to don't buy an op1 or don't start your rack because i felt like when i was making those videos like yes they're just like little one minute clips again but using a eurac system even though i could literally sit down and maybe reverse engineer some of that and try to get something in ableton or whatever or you can argue that a lot of this analog stuff you or, or whatever you can get something that is so close in a piece of software that it's almost not it's almost impossible to distinguish between one another but that becomes true when you have ended up at the result but the journey to get to a result that's where i think it makes a massive difference so the stuff i end up doing on the euro rack i don't think i would have done it in ableton i wouldn't have been able to dream it up it's just because that tool makes me work in a different way ending up with a completely different result and i think it goes the other way as well like if you're using ableton i the stuff that i do in ableton like if i want to do need to do that in euro rack partly that would become super expensive but also like that's not that tool lends it even though i think both ways of working i've changed the way i've used my euro rack because of ableton but also i've totally changed how i work with ableton because of my euro rack system and i don't think that would have happened if i wouldn't have had both um so just just do what feels right to you and if someone doesn't like it that's okay and that leads me into wanting to talk more about um generative music been speaking to ned rush recently and maybe you've even seen the interview that i he did with me or like it was not much of an interview it was more like a, just a conversation so check out ned rush's channel if you haven't done that already um it keeps coming up this thing where we sit there and justify generative music and there must be a reason for us doing that in the first place it's obviously stemming from people questioning it like why like electronic music in general is just like pressing a button and it just like comes out it doesn't take any music musicianship but if we could completely disregard those comments we wouldn't have these conversations why are we not completely disregarding them i think it's to do with that this the skill that's involved in generating making generative music it's not particularly visible it's it's just like i used to be a computer programmer and it was the same there no one had really any appreciation for what went into it because they only saw the final product they didn't see the work that went into it beforehand and i think that's what makes it really difficult to explain to someone especially if they're not even particular if they're not even interested they have just made their mind up makes me think of i saw a um, concert with a lot well the concepts on strange to say but sleep archive the guy from germany who makes techno and i saw him live in sweden he he just stood there behind his laptop and even though the music was good i think it was yeah you could easily say that it was not that interesting to watch because it was someone standing behind their laptop and as far as i know you know i, I don't know he, he could be checking facebook or something it just didn't look like whatever he was doing behind that laptop screen it didn't look like he was particularly busy or it was not particularly interesting to see so i think it's just because the the skill that it takes to make his music that work 
didn't happen there and then on that stage. There are some techno artists that do that, but in his case, his music sounds amazing. And without him, that music wouldn't have existed without his effort, his ideas and his judgment. So... Um, I don't know where this conversation is going. Just maybe I should just pay attention on what's happening in this video. I'm making, obviously feeling like I needed to have some form of pad sound or, or something other than percussion. So here I'm using a bunch of different instruments. I'm using a wavetable. I added in an analog just to add the noise element, just to add a little bit of that. And then I add a sampler. So it's basically one instrument in an instrument rack that comes, yeah, it's, well, it's three instruments in an instrument rack acting as one instrument. And you can just make nice textures in this way. And I'm adding a bit of flanger and chorus. I don't usually make these type of sounds. They sound a bit like presets that you get in synthesizers that just takes up the entire sonic spectrum. Full stereo, like the entire frequency bar, like the entire frequency range. But somehow I ended up here with this sort of big big large cinematic pad and I don't want to spoil it but that pad is going to turn into something very different the beats sound pretty rough scratchy and they sort of distort sometimes but I quite like them I hate the pad though and when I was sitting down doing this I was just not feeling it. I should probably at this point just have like, all right, I'm just going to delete that track and start again, add something else because this sounds, yeah, this sounds like synth preset. Like what do you use these sounds for unless you want to make some soundtrack with some alien caves or something. Gosh, cheesy chords. I would genuinely be interested to hearing from you guys what what you think I should be developing moving forward and make better to make these videos more interesting because I feel like I've reached a level which is I need to break that mold and move on and also I need to yeah I need to develop really because my videos get a, a few hundred views like being a beginner that's very nice and um, I get maybe two handfuls of likes um, I know they are sort of pointless but it's difficult there's diffi it's difficult to know if anyone is appreciating what I do unless I see those things I mean the most meaningful thing is if people write that feels really good um, but I want to make better content so if there is a way if you have any ideas please please share them i don't know if the bird sounds come through in the background i hope the sound isn't too echoey either because i'm finally in the studio the garden studio which yeah we bought a house during lockdown we moved in the 1st of august which had a little got it had a little garden office which i am turning into my studio and the building works just got delayed 
so much that it just became a bit ridiculous and finally my parents could come over the other week so my dad and I have put a new floor in I have painted it it's still fairly empty I just got a massive disc and the modular in here I have ordered a Jasper stand I was just procrastinating and faffing about not knowing what sort of shelving system I needed and it just got to a point where I just had to make a decision so I've ordered a Jasper stand I hope it's gonna do the trick um, I just also have to be a bit careful because I don't have a job at the moment and I might keep it that way for the summer then I just need to get going again I just need to start making some money I need to pay my way uh, but for the time being I want to make as much as I can out of this which means that I just need to make some decisions and just get this studio up and running and it will be the first time in my life that I have a dedicated space that it's not just in the corner of my bedroom and also it should allow me to have everything that I want to have hooked up I should be able to do that in here so it's gonna be quite exciting when that arrives I do hope that it will arrive maybe early next week so I ordered it from Germany but just because the UK unfortunately decided to leave the EU who knows it said I think seven to nine days or something which should mean next week so then I hope to do some videos about um, hardware as well not just Ableton but I will not stop doing Ableton I think it's a fantastic tool and I want to develop develop it further okay so what's happening in the track now okay so I've taken that sort of pad sound that I made and just made some form of melodic arrangement but still I am not not feeling it it just needs to there's just no surprise in there it just sounds generic uh, So what I'm doing there is trying to make some sort of melody. So I mentioned that I moved house last year or during lockdown, my partner and I decided to finally, we should probably take the opportunity of moving in together. And we both had apartments in London well I didn't really have it in London it was it was a a London borough but a Kent postcode so for you who don't know the UK geography means that I was right at the outskirts of the suburbs of London southeast from the center and we realized that we could get something much nicer together if we moved further out which we did I think we were both worried because we were used to London and if you would have asked me a few years ago the only thing I would have, I would have wanted would to move more central but um, I think lockdown changed that both both working from home and also really valuing being outside because there was so such long periods when you were not allowed to be outside and when we went outside, we went to the forest and did sort of things that we wouldn't do as often before the lockdown. And I think it just changed my appreciation for so many things. So now I live on the uh, border between Essex and Suffolk by the water. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, I just love it. I just love being outside being just sitting in the forest or sitting down by the water i suppose maybe it's to do with age as well like i'm just like becoming an old man i guess um, but it also allows me to sort of have this studio space now so also i don't know anything about acoustic treatment but i know that i need to do something about this space because it's very echoey i hope 
not too much of it is coming through in my voice recording. There's probably some of that, but um, I have ordered some acoustic panels. They were cheap and I probably get what I pay for, but it's probably gonna be better than nothing. I'm also gonna get a rug uh, and a few other things. And then I hope with a Jasper stand in here with lots of gear on, then that's gonna be, um, help a bit just to diffuse the sound. Okay, so what am I doing now? I, I took that little, that little uh, loop that I had made, re-recorded it, uh, and now I go in and mess it up, the recording. So I take there, so I took like, I selected a little bit and then command D on the Mac just to duplicate it so you get a bit of a stutter effect, or just do command J so you resample that little section and then I reverse it or re-pitch it or something so you just get little glitchy artifacts here and there. Um, I don't know if I did that on there, we did a cop copy a particular bit over and over again to create a bit of glitch. I suppose I remember like not feeling it quite yet but it was at least heading in some sort of direction where it starts it just started having elements of surprise in there. I think it's difficult with music because there is, there's one thing where it just sounds out of key and sounds bad. And then you have that, that thing where it doesn't sound wrong, but it just sounds incredibly boring. And I think it's that thing where you want to create surprise as in like, the human brain can work out when something is going to change and you do that you live up to those expectations but the change that's where the surprise is you know that there is a change coming but when you deliver on that change the change you deliver is not at all what you expected i think those things are interested to play on and it's certainly something that i need to become way better at because i don't think the music that i write feels as interesting as I would like it to be and I also am not quite sure what to do to make it more interesting. Maybe it's also to do with listening to your own music compared to listening to someone else's music which inherently will have more elements of surprise because you haven't made it, you didn't know, you were not part of that process. Um, the other thing that I'm determined to do this summer is just to set some more goals based on how I would like to develop. What do I want to become better at? What do I want to do more of? I know I want to finish some music. I want to get more music out there in one way or another. I feel like I develop the most when I get to interact with other people or people interact with my music and say what they like and don't like. That fills me with inspiration and ideas. And I need to create more of that. But I suppose making this type of music, it's such a niche, niche market. If market is a good word for this, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, um, so lucky, I suppose, we have internet that you can communicate with people all over the world. But it would be nice to I have this idea. I've had it for a long time, many years, that I would like to have. Let's say you have a basement. You just have electronic musicians bring their instruments. Like someone brings drum, a drum machine. Someone else b b brings a small modular. Someone else brings, you know, something else like a effect boxes and someone else brings some synthesizer with a keyboard or whatever it might be and jamming together and without taking the sound of jazz you take the concept of jazz and you could put a poster up saying you know so and so on drum machine so and so on key so and so on euro rack or whatever it might be I, I, I could just see it working like so let's say someone let's say the person with the drum machine like okay that person sets the tempo and you know like you just look play along and you have to riff and things and it would be interesting also like it would be the sort of music that because you don't necessarily need to watch 
the people doing well you can watch them but imagine like you would go to a jazz club were you there to socialize with your friends to have drinks the music is there sometimes there's a solo you look up and you applaud but it's more it's more like a big social rather than focusing on watching someone performing music it's just part of something that is a bit bigger i think that would be a really interesting thing to do so you, it's it's almost like a bit of improv improv uh Ah, see, I'm using some of the Valhalla stuff. I've paid for some of their plugins because, again, I think their re reverbs are much nicer than the ones that comes with Ableton. But they also do a few that are for free. And if I remember correctly, I think the Space Modulator is one of the free ones. One that is called Supermassive is definitely free. So you should check that one out if you haven't already. I think that one is worth having. Um... Frequency Echo, is that another free one? Maybe? I remember buying the Shimmer Delay and the vin uh, Shimmer Reverb and the Vintage Reverb. And the Vintage Reverb is the one I probably use the most. Um, I think it sounds great. And I think I might have already used it in this track. I can also see that I've <clears throat> taken the original melody playing plus this glitched up recording of it that I've messed about with and then I have added LFO automation um, on the panning and they're both running at the same rate but they are off phase so when one is tilted to the left the other one is to the right and then they cycle back and forth. I suppose I did that because I didn't want to have all the glitches in one ear and doing panning just create a little bit of stereo interest in the track. So yes, well, where do we go next? Making a little bit more of an arrangement here to say when changes are going to come in. We maybe don't want to have that pad from the word go. I'm still not quite feeling it at this point when I made this video. So I have to mess it up a bit more, I think. There's been a few people asking about my Instagram posts, well, how I do the visuals and for anyone who's still curious, I'm using Touch Designer for that. And if you're not familiar with Touch Designer, it is a visual programming language, I suppose, a bit like Max MSP, where you have different components that you connect up with one another, uh, where each component serves a particular purpose. Um, it's like a, a, an object in a if you're a programmer. Anyway, Touch Designer is not focusing on sound, but it's focusing on visuals. And it's a tool that would be used in, if you want, you know, for big live gigs, integrating lighting and projection mapping. And so big artists use this. It's pretty amazing. And you can download a free version. Um, and the only, th as far as I'm aware, the only way the free version is restricted is resolution. But as it happens, the resolution is certainly big enough for an Instagram post. So even though I can't do the live, big live stage work, I would be able to, well, I can do my Instagram posts in there. The stuff that I've done so far is very rudimentary, um, but it's a great way of learning and I am a believer in trying to do a little bit each day. So I'm trying to trying to do a little bit of touch designer work. Um, and also I haven't got that far yet. It inter interacts with audio really well, but it actually also, I believe, interact directly with Ableton. So you can trigger things and you can maybe make a music video. I was thinking about the the recent music video that um, 
that Ned Rush did for his track using the SH-101 and these breakbeats and stuff, which sounded really good. And it looked really nice too. He had made that in um, Max for Live. And I feel inspired, but I'm probably because I'm a bit more, even though I'm still very uh, new to it, I feel like I'm a little bit better at... Um, touch designer and also I think when it comes to visuals that is uh, I might be saying the wrong thing here but I think it is more geared towards that and is perhaps a bit more powerful well you probably wouldn't think that seeing the stuff that I've done but it's because it's beginner stuff so check out go and um, type in touch designer on YouTube and you will be blown away Okay, so what am I doing here? Okay, so I'm obviously wanting to mess this up further. So I've made a group of uh, those different pad tracks and now I am experimenting with the... Um, I've set up a little custom envelope here. Uh, it's basically uh, based on the Shaper um, Max for Live thing that comes with Ableton, but I've modified it so rather than running in a loop like an LFO, it is um, being triggered by MIDI notes instead. So you can use it as an envelope. The only thing it doesn't have is a sustain. I, if I knew how to do that, I would add a sustain stage in, but that's something I could learn. I'm still very much of a beginner when it comes to Max for Live. So I have taken that shaper and I've mapped it to a utility tool, which is on a different track, which is the pad track. So when it when it receives a MIDI note, it it's uh, you can see there is the utility tool that's uh, it's changing its volume. So like every time it triggers, it turns the volume up and then it slowly fades. So I think at this point, I feel like, gosh, this isn't quite right, but now I'm heading in a direction that I feel a bit more happy with. It, it doesn't have that sense of synth preset anymore. So do I spend this long or this short on my one minute's worth of music every day? The answer is sometimes. Uh, the idea is that it's a bit warts and all. I just put, I want to post something every day, music related. Doesn't matter how bad it is. Well, yes, of course, I want it to be as good as it can be. But some days I just don't find the inspiration or I just don't have the time. Maybe I literally have 10 minutes someday. Other days I have way longer. I can spend a few hours on it. So it depends. It depends. And therefore you also end up with very um, different quality each day. Some of it is better than others. Absolutely. But the idea is that if I do something every day, it both makes me explore something each day, just trying something out. Because every single time I come up with something like, oh, what if I do this? So it's good practice in that sense. And it also creates a track record for me to look back on. So it feels like I can hopefully see a little bit of progress where I've learned new things. Also see that I have actually done stuff. I have, it, it becomes like a diary, but I'm glad that, peop that some people have appreciated it because obviously that, that, that becomes part of it. Um, so I think uh, this time I spent around an hour or so just over an hour to make this one minute's worth of music will I ever finish this track no probably not uh, I think I see them all as little sketches but I am due to make a track for the label uh, point source arts I'll put a link in the description so you can go and check them out. I've released some music there um, in the past. Uh, no uh, physical media, just just online. Um, but I think they, yeah, they've been such lovely people based in the US, but the artists are also from Europe. I don't know if there are any non-European artists on there. There might be. Um, and they also have a lovely community on Discord, which I should 
actually engage a bit more with again. There's just so many things going on all the time and I dive into something for a period, but I can't dive into all of it. I'm also trying to learn how to draw and do calligraphy and um, then you just have to like, okay, and then Instagram and then do I need to do Twitter as well and remember to post stuff on Facebook and I need uh, uh, to post things on YouTube and I also actually need to sit down and just make some tracks. Um, but I think doing this little bit minute every day has actually helped me progress and I also it's just like any exercise like when you do physical exercise too that if you haven't done it for a while you just lose momentum a bit and then when you start again you, you've sort of gone backwards a little bit and you will have to get up to speed and I think you get up to speed quicker every time this happens but I am certainly there at the moment um, trying to catch up okay so i'm reaching a point here where i am actually starting to like this this feels this feels nicer it doesn't feel as um, like something that just takes over the entire frequency span so there i'm just trying to am i trying to give it some space no i'm adding drums needs to go in there and i probably also realized that when the drums come back so there's a bit of a break there with this reverse pad sound happens um that when the when the beat is coming back that it needs to come back with something new something more otherwise it doesn't feel like you've gone anywhere but i'm obviously I think I'm here looking for a sound. This is the clap library I've made um, based on, this is not my clap machine. This is the one that I made uh, based on Robert Henke's tutorial. And I think some of those claps are really good. Um, and also I find it more interesting to use something like that rather than the 808 or 909, which you've heard so many times. I don't know if you guys watch, um, I keep mixing them up. One is Fact TV and one is, is it like Do Deutsche Telekom or something, Electronic Beats, where they do these challenges and it's usually some music genre and you get people having to guess and they're all really good. As in like when you hear the techno stuff, the tracks they've picked, it's like, yes, that's also what I associate with techno. So it's, but now most the most recent one, they did drum machines. And that made me ponder that there are there is a few different type of gear. Some gear that everyone well that seem very com that is good, but also seem very common and it seems to be the thing to have. Like uh, the Basimilis Iteritos Alter for Eurac, which is a percussion module, which is like a maths. I have a the Basimilis, but I don't have maths. But um, what other ones are there? Uh, it's it's the um, then you have the sort of old staple machines that are now crazy expensive. But when you see these people in their studios, they like all have. You know, they have a Prophet 5, they have a Juno 106, they have a TB303, they have the 808 and 909, uh, they have a Minimoog. Those machines, like it, some of them have a Jupiter 8, and they are known to be good. They are really well-known instruments. Uh, and then you have the cheap ones like the Volkers and stuff that's super popular as well. But then you have this other category with the weird ones. And some people seem to be really good at them. They sound amazing. Like, uh, I think Aphex Twin made a thing out of it. The Syncussion drum machine, which I believe there's a replica coming back. I have uh, a Eurac module that replicates it. And it sounds damn good. But it, there's also many new instruments like the the wing pinger, which is, seems to be this pinging filter thing. 
Sounds amazing. I have to admit, I want one, but they're very expensive for... But yeah, and also they, they look beautiful. Oh gosh, I'm just realizing that there's lots of stuff happening in the track now. Okay, so now I'm adding the new thing to the to this to this section uh, because the beat needed to change. So I'm adding another element. So I've taken a sampler. I've dragged in loads of different. In I've just took a whole 128 different samples and I have uh, not mapped them to the keys of the keyboard. I have just used the chain selector and then I have a expression control and have a random that just picks them at random. I've set up the sampler to be monophonic, just change the voices to one. I have gone in to set that there's no scale to it. I think if you don't do that, it says to 100% scale. It's like, so if you press a different key that it pitches the sample. I don't want to have the different samples to play in different pitch. I just want them to um, just to be a different sound. Uh, and I've set probably a little bit of a snappy envelope as well. So we just get little clicky glitches and I've made a rhythm that is a combination of, it sort of goes faster and faster. So it starts with eighth notes and then eighth notes with triplets and then um, 16th notes and then 16th notes with triplets uh, to just create a bit of a glitchy beat. And now, Another thing you can do, which I tend to do quite a lot as well, we talked about using reversed sounds to suck the listener into the next section, but then you can have a sound at the beginning of the next session just, just sets it off. That could be a cymbal, but in this case, I've got a very subby kick. Uh, so you get a boom. So you get sucked into the section and then it booms. So here I'm adding the suction sound, I suppose. I don't know what that is, but let's see what what it does. <clears throat> Pitch that down. It's very subtle. That's too squealy that one, so I'm probably just going to change that to something else. What's a different sound? I think it's just a bit of a trial and error, this one. They can be quite small, but I think subconsciously they add uh, a big difference. Okay, let's see how this one works. That's not what I wanted. Oh, that's it. That all of a sudden feels much, much better. We need to turn that volume down a bit, probably. And we can filter it a bit. To... We want the sub in the kick, that the boomy kick that comes in rather than the in the sucking in sound in this case. One thing you can do, like, Talking about the very first track at the top with the kicks, where you have a bit of random elements and things happening, that you can obviously freeze that track or re record it if you want, because then the different glitches will happen at the same time every time you play it back. But now you actually get variety every time you press play, you don't really know where you're going to end up because there's so much randomness in there. I think there's maybe a little bit of a skill in dialing in so you know, like, even though it's random, that it's just random within. Um, a certain span so you don't get horrible noise all of a sudden or it just gets um, awfully loud. Again, this is not a very polished track. I'm going to post this on YouTube once I've recorded, finished the recording, but I um, maybe I'll do that tomorrow together with the track. I usually those posts I do on Instagram, I do the track the day before and then I post them the next morning. I don't know what the best time is to post post something on Instagram really. Maybe I should change it. 
Um, so yeah, spending just a bit more than an hour on this track and um, it's obviously not going to be perfect by any standards, but it's just good to sort of tinker and try, try a few things. I don't know why I'm bothered going in and sort of doing all the EQing and things for such a small thing, but no, I think it's good. Like every little effort helps, I think. Even though I have no clue what I'm doing. Maybe I'm also feeling the imposter syndrome when it comes to this. Probably. Probably. Listening back to see what's happening. So it starts off quite minimal and then sucks into the hi-hat section and then that will move into the pad section but I think the hi-hats are quite overwhelming as soon as the pad starts maybe not I think I ended up removing them though and that means Oh yes, because I had the effects, the clap I think, did I have them triggered by the kick? And there's obviously no kick when it gets into that section. Um, maybe that's a bit weird. I didn't think about that when I was actually noodling around with that. I'm also keen on doing something that feels not just like this. This is just doesn't feel fresh. It might have felt fresh. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 20 years ago or something. I don't know. Oh, I'm doing a little bit on the master channel just adding i found that adding a tiny 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 bit of reverb on the master channel sometimes helps gluing it together and especially if you put it in front of a compressor just yeah i think it's 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 um it's just tying everything together a bit nicer somehow Probably are cutting all the lowest frequencies because I can't hear them anyway. On that note, I finally got. A bit, well, I've got studio monitors again. So I had a pair of Adam A3X studio monitors, quite small, and I had a sub 7 subwoofer to go with them. They sound nice. Uh, I wasn't sure how that the subwoofer made it nice to listen to, um, but without it, I also did, just didn't have much low end to reference. But anyway, I think the Adam speakers sound really good, especially for the price they are. And I'm not a super connoisseur by any standards, but then during the house move, Unfortunately, the subwoofer broke. And I have to say, I didn't have a... The experience with the, the official Adam repair team in the UK wasn't very good. It sort of ended happily and Adam were helpful and they managed to get my money back. And I also got the broken subwoofer back. But... It also just left a little bit of a bitter taste that um, even though I like their products and I think they're very good quality, but if something does happen, I think the circumstances are also really unfortunate. Uh, someone in the repair team that passed away, but anyway, long story. I felt like if this is a risk that me as an individual is maybe not willing to take, so I've decided to not at this time progress with Adam. I'm probably going to sell the speakers. They are good speakers and 
if you're not living in the UK or if you're living in the UK and you're, I don't know, have more luck than I do with uh, the repairs, then they are a good product. Um, but I found a pair of much bigger Genelix um, second hand that I've now got here in the studio and um, they feel, I feel quite excited about having them here. Okay, I think we're coming to uh, wrapping up time very soon. So I'm here I'm just doing a little bit of um, before the break when most things disappear and the pad comes in I just throw a little bit I just used some manual automation of sending the hi-hat into the reverb so you get a bit of a tail uh, and then I do the same with the clap here and then it can reintroduce the hi-hat again and then it can move into the new glitchy sounds um, that we came up with Which track is that? It's probably further down, the glitchy, the new glitchy sounds. Yes, I have to remember to turn the... And now, the glitchy sound comes in. And then it moves in and we have a kick again, and then it just moves to the end. Finding another reverse suction transition sound to put in probably before we got one of the kick comes in, but when the glitches come in, because the one that we had sounded almost better when the hi hat started. So, before the video ends, I should probably say that if you enjoy what i do please let me know it means so much and if you want to subscribe that would be lovely if you want to get access to loads of stuff please consider um if you looked at my other videos and you want to get access to lots of project files and things i um i suggest that you have a look at my patreon it's quite a small cost and you get access to massive sample libraries, project files, some Max for Live devices that I've made, etc. And that may help me also to progress and maybe one day I don't need a full-time job. I do need a full-time job now or at least after August or something, so I need to sort that out. Uh, but please check out my Patreon, it would mean so much. Um, but yes, it's wrapping up time. Time to save. I'll put this project file on Patreon. Um, I've been using some paid for third party plugins in here, so they will obviously not work when you open it. But maybe you can replace some of those reverbs with your own ones if you want to, or um, yes, or if you're tempted you can maybe go and get those um, I hope you enjoyed watching this and just uh, listen to me rambling about stuff thank you very much and uh, see you again bye